Good evening, everyone. Welcome to AJR Behind the Scenes. This is a free webinar series that provides an in-depth look into the inspiration, investigation, and influence of the latest publications in AJR. Today, I'm very excited to have Dr. Victoria Cherniak speak with us about her recent paper on LIRADS. Uh, Victoria, welcome, and, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, well, hi, everybody. I'm Swati. Thank you so much for inviting me. This is a uh... A big honor and very excited to be here. That's great. Um, so your recent paper was called LIRADS Past, Present and Future from the AJR Special Series on Radiology Reporting and Data Systems. Um, I am an MSK radiologist, so I haven't done LIRADS in a while, but I have uh, a lot of just general questions and there's been a lot of interest in your paper. So I'm just gonna right away turn it over to you and if you could give us a brief summary of, of the paper. Okay, well, if it's, all right with you, I'm going to um, do so with some visual help. Yeah. And, um, you know, I'm going to go through some highlights of the paper. Um, the paper is obviously, this is, this is the paper. The paper is called Lyrad's Past, Present, and Future. Um, and um, I'm just going to highlight certain things. Obviously, we don't have time to go through every detail that we have in the paper. Um, so uh, the LIRADS uh, steering committee, the first meeting convened in December uh, 2008. And you can see these are uh, the members of original steering committee. And uh, this, the uh, LIRADS was envisioned uh, to follow the suit of uh, BIRADS. At the time, BIRADS was the only standardized system available. And uh, because of a lot of uh, pressure from um, hepatologists and, and surgeons from two institutions, mainly UCSD and Thomas Jefferson, this, uh, because the reports were so heterogeneous, the LIRADS kind of uh, sprang to life. Um, it, it took three years to release the initial version of LIRADS, which was really a, uh, a relatively short document outlining um, the imaging features and uh, criteria for each of the categories you see that it doesn't look anything like what we are used to seeing LIRADS today with, with tables and algorithms. So that was the initial uh, release. And um, it's this year is an exciting year for us because it's uh, 10 years, a 10 year anniversary since LIRADS has been released. And we've really gone uh, a long way since the initial release when it was just, again, just a TMR diagnostic algorithm, not even an algorithm, just categories and, and imaging features definitions um, and then over time, we added algorithmic approaches, images um, expanded to include hepatobiliary agents, included um, uh, various additional things, included the treatment response. And then um, as things come out, uh, more and more exciting things happen. This is our steering committee, or actually an org chart of the LIRADS. Currently, we have a steering committee, um, and then we have various working groups, which are in charge of uh, tackling separate pieces of a LIRAD and we work closely, obviously we are under umbrella with, of ACR, who also work very closely with other uh, national and international uh, societies. Um, this is our steering committee currently, um, and you can see that we have a, a national, international uh, leaders in, in liver imaging. We have diagnostic radiologists, we have uh, surgeons, we have uh, uh, interventional radiologists, and these are really recognized leaders in the field. Um, and, and they were working tirelessly to uh, improve and continuously improve LIRADS. Um, so now, uh, currently, we have three uh, core documents. You can see them here. And uh, these cores have been uh, translated into multiple languages, as you can see here. Um, I'd like to highlight that all of this work is purely done on a voluntary basis. You can see how many people from across the globe contributed their time and energy and expertise uh, to really making this uh, uh, incredible system that we have right now. Our algorithms comprise of four part, four algorithms. That's, that's our main uh, ecosystem. Uh, we have an algorithm for ultrasound, uh, which is done for surveillance of patients who are at risk for HCC. We have two diagnostic uh, algorithms. Uh, one is uh, focusing on conscious enhanced ultrasound and another one uh, it uses CT, MR, and that includes MR with extracellular conscious agents as well as um, getoxetine. And finally, we also have CT, MR treatment response 
for assessment of a local regional treatment of HCC. This is um, our, for, for, for our diagnostic categories, each of uh, algorithms rather, each category uh, reflects a probability of cancer. And you can see similarly for CUS and CTMR, the higher the category, the greater the probability of cancer and HCC. And then these categories are not just like random things. We, we, we have guidance as to what to do uh, with patients when, when they have these categories, how they should be managed. And uh, this management algorithms is, is fully adopted by um, uh, American Association for Study of Liver Diseases, which is you know, the major governing body uh, for um, hepatology. And uh, also ASLD fully accepted uh, LIRAD's uh, diagnostic uh, categories and ultrasound categories, as you can see here. Um, also, uh, since in uh, 2018, we released a manual which includes uh, uh, all kinds of information for CT and MR. Uh, we have 16 chapters, uh, over 800 pages, which sounds like a lot, but most of the pages are really illustrations, really heavily reached on uh, diagrams, illustrations, and it's really not meant to be a requirement to use LIRADS. It's basically meant to be a textbook of liver imaging. Um, it is available for free to the ACR of, through the ACR website. You don't have to be a member. Um, and this is something that is um, a lot of people we get feedback and find very, very useful. Um, and these are just examples of uh, uh, the figures that we have in pages of our manual. Uh, for people who want to learn LIRADS a little, little more, uh, we, have AC, uh, we have LIRADS educational module, which is available through the ACI website. Uh, for that, you do need to be a ACR member, but you do get a lot of uh, uh, self-assessment uh, credits if you want to do that. And this is the most exciting part that's happened just in the past year. Now we have CT, uh, 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 CT lexicon, which includes terms mostly for TM CTMR, but also uh, for ultrasound and CUS. This is a dictionary for, uh, for all terms that we use for liver imaging. And this lexicon is not just actually for uh, patients who are at risk for HCC, but majority of the terms are intended to be used for any patient who is undergoing liver imaging. And very minority of, of terms is, is for, um, for patients who are at risk of HCC. So we're hoping that um, unification of lexicon, which uh, will be adapted across uh, the globe, will improve comprehensiveness of data that will be collected going on, uh, will improve communication between people, and ultimately uh, we will be able to get a better idea of how, you know, how things need to be changed since we're all going to be kind of using the same language. Um, so that was past, that was present. I'm going to just focus on a few important things about the future of LIRADS. And, uh, you know, one of the things that we has been a goal of LIRADS is to have a unified system in the United States. And we've made, made a major achievement on that front um, uh, in 2018 when ASLD adopted LIRADS and there's no more separate uh, ASLD uh, system. And, um, you know, as at the time that we wrote the paper, the unification with UNOS and OPTN was still kind of a hope and a dream, something we were working on, but was not yet happening. As of today, I can say that this, this uh, we're very close to achieving this goal. We, we've already um, uh, gotten approval from the, uh, from the governing body from OPTN for OPTN to adopt LIRAS 5 criteria fully um, because it's a process that's going to take maybe another six to nine months for you know for everything to go through, but uh, we are we're we're almost there. And I just want to highlight Dr. Hecht and Dr. Fowler um, who are leading this uh, wonderful effort. And because we are uh, uh, we don't want to stop just in the United States. We really the ultimate goal is to have a unified system in the world. Um, so again, so that we can all speak the same language and patients can get unified care. Um, throughout the uh, different parts of the globe. This is just a summary slide of all the um, diagnostic HCC systems that exist currently in the world, and you can see there are quite a number of them. Um, and then they're very similar, but they're not quite the same. 
um, just to highlighting the four major ones, you can see that in a case like this is very simple. Uh, all diagnostic system will accept this as an HCC. But then you can go into nuances. And for example, a lesion that's less than one centimeter, only a puzzle criteria will accept it as not you know, diagnostic of HCC uh, without biopsy confirmation. Uh, for um, only Asian criteria, only Asian diagnostic systems will accept uh, hepatobiliary phase hyperintensity as a washout uh, and use that uh, for the diagnosis of HCC and uh, Lyrids and uh, easel will not. And then, uh, for example, this lesion, um, again, only Lyrids will diagnose this as definitive HCC based on imaging because only Lyrids has capsule as part of their uh, diagnostic system. By the way, all the cases that I showed right here are path-proven HCC that we're resecting. So you can see how um, having these tiny little nuances for, between each, you know, each um, uh, systems, you can see how it can affect uh, management of any given uh, patient. So why do we have these different systems? Because there are major regional differences in management paradigms for patients with HCC, because in, pa in, in patients uh, in, in North America and, and uh, Europe, um, because we have you know, a larger proportion of patients who have cirrhosis and can't get really um, resection, and the ultimately the best treatment that we can offer to these patients is transplantation, um, really our systems maximize, maximize specificity where once we give patient priority, you know, priority points uh, uh, for transplant, we want to be making sure that the patient truly has uh, hepatocellular carcinoma. In Asian countries where there is a much greater proportion of patients with hepatitis B who can be resected, um, and, and it's an uh, endemic uh, a disease there, um, in, in Asian uh, countries, it's really sensitivity that needs to be um, highlighted because they want to be able to treat uh, earlier cancers quickly and not wait for, you know, for, for more advanced stages. So what is the solution? Um, we probably won't be able to create a system that will satisfy both the need for sensitivity and specificity, just like in any other situation, you know, sensitivity and specificity kind of move in a different direction. So if we change the criteria to improve sensitivity, we invariably will lose specificity and one of the two, you know, I, you know, will be happy. So the solution that we are thinking of in the future, and this is something that we're discussing with, you know, with various um, uh, stakeholders is that we would have a single unified diagnostic paradigm. However, the, uh, the management guidance will be region specific. So for countries where specificity is necessary, only LIATS 5 would be treated as definite cancer that does not need to be, you know, need, need path confirmation prior to treatment, as opposed to in Asian countries, both LIATS 4 and LIATS 5. Uh, could be accepted as, you know, as uh, H2C that can just go for treatment. Um, so I'm going to stop right here. And, you know, the, the paper has more, more information there. Um, there are lots of uh, current gaps in knowledge that still need to be addressed, that will be addressed, or we're hoping to address in the future. But this is kind of the highlight of what, you know, what we really want to achieve. Um, and have achieved so far. Yeah, that was a great summary. Thank you for, for sharing those slides. Um, I, I also love the, the real-time update on, on the progress. And I guess, you know, my, my question for you is, you've talked about how LIRADS has evolved in the past decade and even is now evolving from the time of publication of your paper um, to today. Where do you see it going in, in the next 10 years, in the next decade or so? Ah. I was prepared for this question. Okay. So um, again, th this is this is a great question, and you know it, we can make an entire presentation just on things that we want to accomplish. Uh, but there is an ultimate goal, and uh, a lot of pieces that, that we're doing eventually will kind of feed into us achieving this goal. And um, so, if my slide will move. So, okay, so um, what do we have right now, right? We have right now a patient with either cirrhosis or chronic hepatitis B who has a lesion. 
uh, we put this patient either um, on CT or MAR or COS, and then we look at a combination of major features, LRM features, ANSI features, we put them together, we look at our table, and we come up with a category. And as I mentioned before, the category will give us an idea or an estimate of proportion of probability that this lesion represents HCC and malignancy. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's relatively a crude system. And in the future, we want to become much, much more granular. So in addition to um, the features, right, um, something that we do now, we will, uh, on the observation level, add other things like texture analysis, like some sort of AI features or features that we're not even sure yet or prognostic features that are emerging right now. Uh, to that, we would add features uh, related to background liver, liver volume, iron overload, fat, you know, uh, steatosis, the stiffness of the liver, again, texture analysis of the liver itself, any other you know, features pertaining to the background liver that you know, will be emerging in the future that I don't even know about right now. To that, we will look at other things that are related to patient, um, including portal hypertension, you know, ascites, Sacropy, body composition, all the things that we know, uh, or we suspect are uh, associated with, with prognostic features. And then these are just imaging characteristics, but they're also patient characteristics, you know, patient, author, you know, patients, uh, you know, demographics, patients, you know, how, you know, what they, you know, what their diet, you know, they're doing anything bad, their genetics, what viruses they're exposed to, what biomarkers they have, any, you know, if we have information from liquid bio, and so on and so forth. So all this wealth of information will be integrated into some sort of AI model, which all that will be put together. And instead of giving these general categories, which are, you know, relatively wide bucket of, of probabilities, we will have a very specific thing which will say, okay, in this particular patient with these particular features, with this particular everything, this observation is 99% probability of being malignant, it has 93% probability of being HCC, and it has a three, you know, 33% uh, five-year probability of recurrence after local regional therapy. So this is a, a very big and important goal that we want to achieve. And again, a lot of things that we're doing and we're focusing on directly or indirectly takes us closer to this almost fantastical goal. Now you may be thinking that I'm crazy because it is kind of fantastical, um, but I want to um, show you something. This is uh, Claude Serlin, uh, I wanna give a shout out to him. He's, he's the original chair of the Lyra Steering Committee. He's the uh, father of the Steering Committee. Uh, and he shared with me, this is the slide that he showed in 2011 um, as his vision of, of uh, what liars will be in the next 10 years. And at the time, this seemed as fantastical as what I just showed you. But I want to say that in 10 years, which is, you know, it's not a short period of time, but it's not 50 years, right? So in these 10 years, we pretty much achieved everything he's envisioned. Um, and we are working on data collection mechanisms and national registry and uh, things like that. So um, we have this goal, you know, will we achieve it in 10 years? I don't know. Will we achieve it in 50 years? Probably. Um, but we, we're doing a lot of things that will take us that much closer to that goal, including, you know, uh, having a lexicon that is um, very unified that will give us data to kind of make these probabilities more granular, including we're, we're creating uh, you know, registries that will provide us again with this data um, and, and just creating large consortium of scientists um, who will look into all of these pieces. And eventually, of course, uh, machine learning will, will kind of solidify and put it all together. So this is like our ultimate, ultimate goal of where we want to go. Wow, I'm, I'm so impressed by not just your breadth of knowledge of where Lyra was and where it is today, but also your, your vision for, for the future. <laughs> you're, you're a true visionary, Victoria. Um, and I, you know, I would just love to get your thoughts on radiology reporting and data systems in general. Like you mentioned, it all began with BIRADS and now there are more and more RADS available and currently being created across subspecialties. They're actually all up on the ACR RADS website. I personally am interested in a RADS for perfect 
peripheral nerve imaging and MR neurography. And as our team was creating it, it just got more and more levels and more and more complicated. Um, and I just like, I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on the general emergence of these reporting systems and, and future directions for how it, it impacts the field of radiology. So, you know, obviously I'm, I'm a big proponent of, of rad systems, you know, for various reasons. Um, I, I do think that they make our lives as radiologists easier. I think that if you're not, um, if you're not an expert, right? Um, some, you know, let's say, you know, you as an MSK radiologist, you know, you don't read, let's say a lot of body. And then all of a sudden you need to, and you, you're faced with something, you know, um, and you haven't read a lot of liver, that may be challenging, right? Maybe not for you, but like, you know, I mean, um, <laughs> so like I remember, I remember I had this amazing um, attending uh, who, who was just incredible at reading plain films. And, and he'd be like, Dr. Spray, how did you see this? And he, he would just lay back and be like, I don't know, the films just speak to me. Mm. Right. And, and I think that he, he's, he was right, you know, once you get to a certain level of expertise and, and honing in the one areas, films do speak to you, right? You look at something and you just know what it is, but that requires a very high level of expertise. And if you're a junior radiologist or if you're a radiologist who's, you know, who's, you know, who's not self-specializing, you're doing everything, you know, perhaps you cannot have this level of expertise in everything, right? Sure. So I think that's where the RAD systems really help. Um, to give you a very personal example, I, um, you know, I, I only recently moved to BI in, in my prior uh, place. I haven't read ultrasound in like six, seven years, just, just, I, I wasn't, I wasn't doing that. So now when I have to read thyroid ultrasounds, I don't know, like, I don't have that level of expertise at all. And Tyrads is a godsend to me because I can look up exactly what needs to be done, what, you know, cause I don't. You know, thyroid ultrasounds don't speak to me because I haven't done them for so long, but thyroids helps me to, you know, to, to do the right thing for the patient and, and to leverage the expertise of others who created the system. So I think that in that respect, I, I absolutely love RADS. Um, and in terms of creating um, a new RAD system, it's a very arduous process for various reasons, because, you know, when you're creating a new system, a lot of it has to, you know, you know, there are a lot of pieces that have to come together. You have to have a good team. Um, and, you know, and when, you know, people have different expertise and different ideas, so that's one piece of it. Probably the more challenging piece is um, having uh, literature to support your decisions, right? And um, a lot of times, again, because we all speak slightly different languages in terms of how we describe things, when you try to pull things together and say, well, you know, what about like this, this imaging feature is that like diagnostic of X and all of a sudden you find that this imaging feature is described in seven different ways. And are they really describing the same feature or are they describing slightly different? Can, can we combine this data or cannot? And these things become very difficult. And sometimes you don't get it right in the first time. And I don't know if you remember, but the initial version of Pyrads didn't look anything what the Pyrads looks now. Um, you know, so they, they created something, they gathered the data that wasn't really working and they, you know, redone it and now it works much better. So, you know, so you probably won't get it right from the first time and revisions will be necessary. But I think once all the details kind of get settled in, the systems become much more stable. I know it's a very long winded answer. <laughs> yeah, I know. I think um, one of the highlights from your article that, that I took away was how LIRAD's um, algorithm has evolved to incorporate science and user feedback and new technology. Um, and that is, I think, so important for other RAD systems that are more recently created or are being currently developed um, just to maintain the same relevancy with, with changing times. Do you have any advice for, for people working on these different RAD systems and also RADs across modalities, which you mentioned is kind of newer to LIRADs. Right, so, you know, uh, kind of creating a single system that, you know, satisfies everything is always challenging because again, you know, for example, people, you know, so there, there, there are some complaints that LIRADs is much more complicated than let's say BIRADs or even right. PIRADs. 
and it's true but you know if you if you look at the actual disease processes it's you know it's a required it's it's an unfor you know it is what it is right so because liver has many more certain things that are happening there you know, than pyrids and um and again if you look at all the rad systems they sort of are similar in the sense that they you know you have you know categories most of them have one through five and then as the categories increase the probability of disease increases but then once you start looking into things you cannot possibly make them all the same because the disease processes are different right mm -hmm. so to give you an example you know again lyrids was fashioned after virads and then virads there's a virad six which is path proven um breast cancer and then uh, we did a survey with users and there was a fairly significant interest in having a lyrads six um category that would be equivalent you know that would be you know equivalent to virad six mm -hmm. and we thought we you know we discussed it was a long discussion but the final decision was you know for 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 liver for hcc it's, it's, it doesn't work because you know, for virids, pathology still is not, even when you have virids five, pathology is necessary to confirm cancer. But for HCC, this is not the case. Once you reach virids five, you're done. So introducing a virids six category would inadvertently give a signal that biopsy is necessary, right? So like these little nuances are specific to each disease process and they're necessary and yes, they are, you know, there's no way around them. And the same thing for within system, you know, each modality has um, its own little quirks, right? So I know nothing about nerve imaging, like at all, <laughs> like at all. <laughs> so if I say something idiotic, just don't laugh at me. <laughs> but, like, but I assume that features that you see on ultrasound and on MR aren't necessarily the same features. So, you know, creating a system that will cover both modalities may not be possible, right? So you may need to have a system that is applicable to ultrasound and a system that's applicable to MR. Um, and then, you know, and that's just maybe that's the only way to do it for nerve roots. Um, for other things, like, like, for example, for lyrids, right? CT and MR, we have pretty good evidence that even though CT and MR, you know, combining and applying one algorithm to both modalities is, is valid. And we're just finishing up, let's say, a, a large uh, meta-analysis looking specifically at modality-specific performance, and, and we're validating that it is an okay approach. But the, you know, if you look at criteria for CUS, they're slightly different than from CTMR, again, because of CUS having a very different underlying conscious mechanics, and you just cannot create one thing that will satisfy CTMR and CUS. Does that make sense? So, and, and it's okay, right? You have, you know, you, you can't make things too simple because they do have to work. So a certain level of complexity unfortunately will exist, um, but sometimes just can't get over it. Yeah, so with the, um, with the complexity of these RAD systems and with them continuously evolving you know, over time, what do you think are, are the best ways for radiologists and our collaborating clinicians to stay up to date with the most recent RADs that is being used or is being advocated to be used? Um, well, I always recommend that uh, to look at the original source. So instead of going to, you know, to a secondary site that refers, let's say, to, to this particular, the best way is to go to ACI RADS page and, and all the original materials are there and you can get them. For every RADS that you go into ACR, there are a lot of teaching materials. You know, most, most RADS provide separate lexicon, separate atlas. Uh, some provide uh, teaching cases, you know, as I showed, Lyra's has, you know, educational module, other ads do, do similar things. So there's a lot to be gained from there. And then, you know, chances are most of us won't need all rats, right? So like, 
but you know, if you're in a private practice, you may end up needing five, six, seven rads. Um, and you know, and you know, you can have, you know, you can print out a sheet, right, and have it right next to you. Um, you know, go to, you know, when you go to RCNA or ARS, you know, go to lectures that, that cover these. You know, usually, usually there's uh, things like this, and you can ask questions. Um, uh, there is a, uh, there is a uh, for there's an overarching uh, site that will cover a lot of uh, frequent FAQs for all RADs, and there's a way to actually send a question to the ACR, and that question then will be forwarded to the uh, steering committee, appropriate steering committee, and then we usually respond. Uh, with, so we have a lot of questions that are sent, sent to us, and we're glad we're happy to respond. So there's a lot of things, and you can find things that kind of suit what you like. Right, so some people like to read books, some people like to watch webinars, all of these things are available. Um, and just, yeah, and not get frustrated. And yes, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're not gonna be all the same and some are gonna be simpler, some are gonna be a little more complex. But if you just kind of, I don't know, to me, I think it's easier to have RADs than not have them, even when they're complex. Sure. and. Um... And I know you're on Twitter as well. So if people have questions or updates, I'm sure you'll be yeah. posting on your account. Um, thank you so much for your time. We're, we're almost at time here and that has been such a wonderful discussion. I do have one last question for you that we like to ask all of our distinguished guests here on uh, AGR Behind the Scenes. Uh, what is your advice for, for medical students, for residents and for young faculty who are interested in academic radiology? Um, if you're interested, if you like it, if you like, you know, if you like it, um, do it. Don't be scared. Don't be thinking, you know, and then um, academic radiology is very heterogeneous, right? So in some places you can focus just on teaching and in some places it's more heavy research. So if you like teaching, but you hate research, don't think that academic radiology is not for you. You can find a place that will really fit your, will, will really fit fit what you want. And it's a really uh, a wonderful thing to do. And if you are even a little bit inclined in research, don't be scared and thinking that, you know, I will never be able to write, you know, 10 papers in, the, in a year, uh, which is what I thought when I started. And like, I thought that like my max is one paper per year and it's fine, you know, but just don't think that, don't look at somebody who's like, who's like 7,000, publication and think, well, I'll never get there. So therefore this is not for me. Uh, plenty of people, you know, you can customize your life the way you want it and make it and focus on things that you like and um, seek mentors, talk to them, ask them questions. And uh, most people are very happy to, to give advice. That's great. Thank you again for joining us. And just one last time, if anyone has questions for Victoria, she is on, uh, on Twitter, as am I, along with AJR and ARS. So Victoria, thank you again. It was a pleasure. Um, thank you. Thank you, Swati. Again, this was a, a great opportunity to talk about Lyrads. Thank you again for thinking of me and of Lyrads for, for the series and for all of you who are on the line. Uh, thank you so much for joining. Great. Happy holidays. Happy holidays.